Good morning, folks. It's 5.46 a.m., February the 22nd, uh, 2018, so they tell me. And there's much to do today. Uh, there's a whole lot I'm going to talk about. I'm probably going to bounce around a whole lot. Right now, concerning the language and my studies on the language, well, I'm definitely further down the road uh, than I went than when I made the that last video, uh, the brick wall. Although uh, I think it was clear from what I expressed in that that understanding the Hebrew language as it was uh, originally known by our ancestors, the Obari and Yisraelites, Yisraelim, um, is different, was different than the understanding that we have of it today. And it's uh, all too easy to demonstrate how it's been changed. Now, I am kind of glad that uh, my route to work is full of uh, so many um, dead zones uh, as far as my phone goes because I was trying to get a few things uh, off my mind the other day and I tried to make the live stream because if I just record to my phone and then um, bring that to the job site my phone is unusable essentially, for the rest of the day, or however long it takes for that to upload. So that's not very convenient. And I think that I, I just rambled too much. And um, a good deal of that rambling was me expressing a lot of my frustration. Because uh, I... I have been spending a great deal of time laying uh, a lot of groundwork to offer um, the world in, in general. Um, but, you know, the, the community of people who, who want to know and understand what the Hebrew Scriptures are saying. And uh, if we can, we can uh, better understand what the uh, Aramaic portions uh, of it are saying too. And you have to understand that we're told that the only um, extant copies of uh, not only Daniel... 2.4 to 7.28, which are massively, massively important um, pieces of scripture concerning eschatology. And, I mean, big, uh, universal, worldwide uh, eschatology. There, that's, it's, it's massive. And, but we're told that that's all in... Uh, uh, what we have of it is all in Aramaic, and there are there are enough uh, there is enough significance uh, difference between uh, Aramaic and Hebrew um, as far as the language did exist when it was used and understood by our ancestors. There's enough of a difference there uh, for that to be problematic concerning our understanding of it. Now it's not only. Uh, that portion of Daniel, but also Ezra. I don't want to say Nehemiah, um, because that doesn't make any sense to me that Nehemiah would have been written in Aramaic or them claiming that it was written in Aramaic. Um, Nehemiah shows an obvious disdain for... Um, in, in a sense, language and culture outside the preservation of the Israelite, or in, in his case, uh, Judahite uh, language and culture. So that wouldn't make sense at all. Um, but I'll have to double check because now that I think about it, I think that it is claimed 
that they are in Aramaic. Um, right there, Aramaic portions of the Old Testament. And we we can go to Wikipedia if we have to. Um, so okay, uh, the history, and they're gonna try to tell us what the differences are. Um, undisputed occurrences. Aha, Genesis thirty-one forty-seven, Jeremiah ten eleven. See there, you know, Daniel two four uh, through seven twenty-eight, and uh, oh, Ezra four eight uh, through six eighteen and seven twelve through twenty-six. So they're saying just portions of Ezra. So yeah, um, nothing from Nehemiah. Now, it, some actually accuse Ezra of being the scribe that that changed Hebrew to the point of some, and it, it, there are some that claim that <laughs> Ezra's the scribe who actually introduced the Nakud. And there's no foundation for that whatsoever. That's a flight of fancy. So, okay. This might do knock to me. All right. So I've got a document up here uh, that I wrote myself. And it, um, it contains 50, five, zero, 50 words. And I'm going to read this to you here real quick, okay? And he, Begyuch the man, until Mji of Gifto. That is why men call the place... Skemim of the tired Bamut. So Jim went forward from there to the Hraf of the water and there swore to Yahweh to never vigitum at the Frang. That place is in the Zunkalin. Do you understand? Does that help you? Does that help you figure out the, and and understand the reason that that happened? Or why Jim did what he did to the man at the beginning? Or swore what he swore to Yahweh to never vigit him at the frang? Do you understand? You see, these few sentences contain 50 words. Out of those 50 words, nine of them are not understandable. There's no lexicography for these words. And because of that, um, I defy anyone to then extrapolate or extract doctrine and extrapolate any wisdom or teaching from that to go ahead. You see, I've told you in the past that it's commonly known, although not many people want to uh, admit it. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not widely publishing this. That 20% of the he Hebrew, uh, biblical Hebrew lexicography is unknown. It can't be proven. Not by the system they use, not by the Masoretic rules. And what they understand about it, you see. 20%. And I've told you that furthermore, in my studies thus far, um, I could call BS 
on a lot of their words that they say that they do understand, that that really is uh, the meaning of that word. If, if I were to have inserted 20% of unknown words into these few sentences I just read you, I would have had to have actually slipped at least one more unknown word in there. That's not even 20% of the words. All of those, to your ears, incoherent words in there, um, they don't even add up to 20%. They're just short. It's only 9 out of 50. And I hope that what that does is, is illustrate to you the real problem we're looking at. So, I suppose this helps to, to, to get an idea of my current frustration with so many people out there who are uh, continually um, pontificating on scriptures and applying those scriptures to um, current world events or past world events um, and doing this even without a, a tint of embarrassment since they're pulling it all from English translations of languages that we admittedly don't fully know or understand. You see, at this point in time, I'm not sure that I see a a need for us to uh, passionately argue doctrines and ideologies because we don't have a full understanding. It, if everything in the New Testament is um, um, fulfillment and consummation of everything uh, demonstrated uh, to us in the Old Testament, and we don't understand a good 20% of the words being used in the Old Testament, then how is it that we can properly um, uh, teach any kind of uh, uh, a doctrine and have any kind of solid theology that um, will separate over and and argue over uh, things that we think uh, are somehow strong enough to to teach others a way that they should think or do or act. Um, and you know, concerning this, the rubber meets the road. Um, uh, in a good illustration, uh, there is a guy in, in um, the realm of identity, which I'm going to remind everyone again, I am not a, a Christian identitarian. If, if by identitarian um, you mean all of those who believe that the only people who have been, are being, and will be saved is genetic Israelites. Now, if you want to call an identitarian somebody who, through their uh, searching, um, has found that out of all the peoples of the earth, the peoples who most fit the eschatological sketch of Israel in these days and times of ours are the Northern European Caucasians, and, and maybe more th than that, I'm not 100%, but if you want to call me an identitarian because of that, because I, I say that it, it appears to me that um, uh, 
uh, the, the northern type European is uh, the most likely candidate for the descendants of, of Israel to this day, then uh, fine. But the problem is that I've just uh, encountered far too many voices in what is labeled as Christian identity that have far, far too much uh, uh, bigotry and, and far too little love of the Father and the Son for me to want to group myself by title with them. So I was listening to a particular identitarian who said that um, he was speaking to an evangelical Christian who uh, had invited him to come and fellowship with uh, this group of, of people at this evangelicals church body, church building, you know. Um, a lot of church bodies, church buildings, they, they have um, uh, dinners together frequently after services, which I, I think is a great idea. More, um, more, more church bodies should do that, should feast together. Um, that, I think that's, that's a, a common theme that we see uh, throughout the Bible is us gathering and, and feasting together. And, and then there's the love feasts, you know, um, mentioned in the New Testament uh, also. Anyways, so this guy uh, said, and he said this proudly, that... Uh, he told this guy that he, he couldn't come and uh, fellowship with them um, because they were defiled, because they ate swine flesh. They did not eat clean foods, so they were defiled. And he would not come and fellowship with them because they were defiled. Now, when I heard this, I asked this gentleman on this video if he could please prove the lexicography of those clean and unclean beasts as listed in Leviticus 11 and elsewhere in Deuteronomy. To which I got a reply. I don't think I don't know if it was from him or just um, uh, a listener that it's very clear the list of clean and unclean animals that can be eaten in, in, in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy. And I said, yes, well, it's clear that there are words on a page that are put together into thoughts and ideas. The problem is the burden of proof is upon you if you want to say that uh, swine flesh uh, pollutes a man and you cannot eat with them because they are polluted all right wonderful um, why don't you prove that any particular animal in there is a swine and that swine flesh is filthy and that to this day no one should be fellowshipped with because they eat pork they're going to have some trouble. I can tell you for a fact that Leviticus is full of particular words that we don't know the lexicography to. That's a fact. So I don't see what all the fighting and the arguing and the just hating one another and, and whatnot just for the, I guess, just, just so that you can be angry. Um, Maybe just so you can isolate. Maybe just so you can glory in your own flesh, thinking that there is anything better about your flesh than the flesh of another when all flesh is tainted by sin. So until we get these things figured out, this base language figured out, all the theorizing and pontificating that uh, so many do. I guess I don't want to say that it's entirely moot, but a good deal of it, I believe, is. 
Now, I have started so many various uh, documents that contain lists of types of Hebrew parent roots, two-letter roots and uh, three-letter roots. And I'm sorry for calling them letters. They're actually characters or icons, pictographs, glyphs, whatever you want to call them, but not letters because they have meaning. They are images. Uh, the thing is, I did most of these lists at first, and I'm still working on these lists by hand on lined notebook paper, because that is the only way I can really do this with any kind of speed whatsoever. But when it comes to taking all of these things and then transferring them into a... Um, I'm going to start rolling my mouse over some of the documents that I'm currently working on. This document here is a sketch of each tribe, who they were, uh, the significant things that the patriarchs themselves did, their blessings from Jacob, Moses, anyone else, curses from anyone else, and specifically their land inheritance. This is all done using the uh, Hebrew character that I made into a font based on all the characters that I have looked at in the last year. Um, this is a beta, so it can change. Um, the, the next list is, uh, this is the two icon or two character parent roots. Um, how they are represented in their Masoretic, um, form today. Uh, there's Strong's reference number and um, the form that they appear in in the texts themselves, how they are translated, and what is their most likely translation. Okay, that's another list. And I have the full list of all two character parent roots all written out by hand that have to be translated into these charts. And these charts, who are they for? They are for, uh, they are for the use and edification of the saints. That's precisely what they're for, to glorify our God here in this world. The next one is a alphabetical list of the Hebrew characters um, and their current name or title and whether or not the evidence we see concerning that name should lead us to believe that that character should be called by that name because one of the things that's going to have to be done is these characters are going to have to be given new names when we understand exactly what they stand for. Um, the next list is a list of um, common English words and the Hebrew words listed as translated from. So what I do for this is I go to uh, a site that has a complete A to Z uh, listing of all the English words that occur in the King James translation of the Bible. Because remember, I told you that Strong's, which is one of the most exhaustive and complete listings of Hebrew and Greek words, is coded to King James. So, um, for the purposes of getting further down the road and figuring these things out, it's just, it's, um, it's most productive to work from the, the King James doing this. I don't put any stock into the King James as a translation. I don't put any stock into Strong's Concordance as a good tool for understanding the Hebrew or the Greek. Now, this is just a representation of a few lists that I have. And, for instance, these two character parents that have to be made into this chart for the benefit and edification of the saints, that's only one of a number of different types of two and three character parent roots that I have listed. This is so that we can try to understand all this bulk. 
in the Old Testament, which has so much bearing on the New, so that we can have a unity of mind. So that when these charlatans and these con men, these slick talkers and sophists want to um, keep spreading old lies that they say are new about the uh, character, uh, the nature of the God of the scriptures and what the scriptures are in fact saying, that the saints can know for a fact what the scriptures are saying and clearly present an objective argument against all the inflammatory things that um, the enemy just continues to spew out of their mouths. So essentially, there's going to have to be uh, a team of people that are willing to take this, that are willing to download onto their computer um, whatever the latest version of um, LibreOffice is and receive um, basically document assignments from me and follow through on those things in a um, um, an organized, um, logical way to, um, to produce these lists and these charts, this information that can only help to, um, increase the understanding of, um, those people that we call our brothers and our sisters. Um, I make my email address available uh, all the time, and um, I do correspond to uh, a number of uh, subscribers, and um, uh, some of my correspondence is conversational. Some of the correspondence is um, people offering various um, ideas and what they think are helps. And, you know, I... Uh, I always appreciate um, whatever it is people want to, to offer. I do. Um, at this point in time, what I would prefer, though, is uh, anybody who's willing to commit time, because this all takes time, anybody who's willing to commit to that kind of time and, and do the work not on a whim, but to do the work, to contact me. I'll put my email address in the, um, uh, in the description again. So outside of that, <clears throat> there are a few things um, that I do want to bring up because um, I'm at a certain point in uh, so many facets of study that, um, you know, I can't really present a finished product. I think it was, um, it, it might have really been shooting the moon uh, to think that I could present at the point in time when I did videos that um, were hoping, I guess, to provide a whole lot more clarity on the individual letters. Um, I don't know that I'm there yet. But the thing is, as time goes by, I get greater and greater and stronger and stronger impressions of what these characters are or how they should be used, viewed, interpreted. So there's progress being made. But right now, you know, I've got a number of um, not only impressions, but um, things that I've I've come across that um, are, of, are, as far as I'm concerned, are of interest. And um, I'm going to kind of show you a few. And I may have to 
pause and restart so I can get queued up to the places where I need to be without you sitting and waiting for me to, um, you know, throw in the searches or, or get there or whatever. And I'm just going to present you with a few things. Not all of them are that in-depth, but, um, you know, when you, um, when you keep absorbing all of this information and you, you've got it uh, stored up in your head, sometimes you have to get it back out of there to make more room for more. Uh, so that will explain the uh, somewhat sporadic nature of this particular video. Okay, so I would like to start by spending a few minutes discussing this idea that the flood of Noah, or actually Nah, was worldwide. Now I call him Nah because his name actually only consists of two characters, uh, the N or Nun and the H or Het, or they call Ket or Chet, N and H, Nah. The Masoretes uh, took it upon themselves to add the uh, proper Nikud to um, uh, force someone to put an O sound in there. Now, did they extract a number of O's or a vowel that we are not aware of and replace it with the Nakud? At this point in time, I don't know. But I know that on uh, the page in the text, his name consists of an N and an H. Nah. So whether or not his flood was worldwide, there's some problems. There's some problems. And uh, I'm not going to claim that I've got all of the answers or solutions to these problems. But I would like to point your attention to Genesis chapter 2. Now remember, Masha, or Moses, Masha is credited with the Torah. And so... In Genesis, and we know this because we actually see three of these rivers again, and the lands that they are in, uh, in relation to geographically, still exist at the time of Noah and uh, Israel and them going into the promised land and forward. Now again, I made the error of calling them rivers, because I don't yet know that they are rivers, but I do believe that they are water. They're some kind of water. But starting in Genesis 2.10, it says, And a river, and we don't know that, a waterway, uh, went out of Odin to water the Gan, or garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads, or chiefs. The name of the first is Pishun. That is which compasseth, and I don't know if that's absolutely compass and compass or not, the whole land of Hula. Now remember, when Yisrael came back into the land, the promised land, there were a people living there called the Hui, which is um, usually translated into English as Hivite. Well, this is a land of Huila. Now it says where there is gold, and <clears throat> the gold of that land is good. Gold is one of those words that might have an unknown lexicography. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone. Again, both of those things possibly unknown lexicography. This is why we have to know the character. We have to know the language so we can know these things and understand. The name of the second waterway is Gehun. Uh, the same is that which compasses the whole land of Kush. The name of the third waterway is Hadquil, and it is that which goes towards the east of Ashur, and the fourth is Parath. Now Parath is uh, all over the place in the rest of scriptures and two of the other three waterways are mentioned at least one time later on down the road. So these waterways are contemporary 
at the time when Masha is writing this. They are contemporary at the time of the judges, Joshua, um, earlier the patriarchs, and later the books of the kings, chronicles, the prophets. Jeremiah goes to the Parath, which is translated as Euphrates. You see, the problem here is, is this. These waterways, uh, they still exist throughout the writings of Scripture. And in fact, if we trust the, the Greek translations in the New Testament, um, the Euphrates is actually mentioned again twice in Revelation. Is it the same river? The same waterway? I don't know. But I do know this. The power of a flood is often beyond comprehension. And now where I live, uh, there was just, uh, we got over a foot of snow a week or so ago. And that was on top of a bit of snow we already had. So we had a lot of snow. And then a few days ago, it warmed up amazingly. It was very warm for a couple of days and rained. Warm rain. The flooding was pretty extensive. Um, a number of roads have been shut because the rivers near them have swallowed them up. Um, the destruction to the roads just from that, that amount of snow, the quick thaw, and the rain has been amazing. That's just from a foot or so of snow and then a warm spell with rain. It caused damage all over the place. That's nothing. That's nothing compared to what some of the major floods do in some areas that are, say, uh, towns built on the slopes of or at the bottom of a number of mountains that have a propensity to flood. The damage can be so utterly catastrophic that a great flood coming off a mountain can bury a city to a certain degree. It can take down large buildings because when you have a flood you don't just have water. When you have a flood that water is a medium that transports every possible kind of solid object that exists. When large rivers, um, large fast-moving rivers, overflow dramatically, uh, the amount of debris that they move um, sometimes boggles the mind. They can move uh, boulders the size of cars and trucks, and not to mention the huge trees, uh, structures made of wood and steel and stone in their way and the damage to the landscape is sometimes irreparable. Now you have to take that understanding of what small floods can do to a landscape and then you have to transpose that into the idea of a world wide flood. There would be absolutely nothing to stop these waters. I can't begin to imagine, nor do I want to imagine, what the size of the waves could be.
<clears throat> or the size of the um, there would there would gather together essentially debris masses that who knows um, they, they could be the size of small countries traveling around in this worldwide water with such great violence the mind can't even grasp now that's just on the surface now at ground level again uh, small floods transport rocks and 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 vehicles and uh, anything big like that they transport these things and they use them like jackhammers will uh, a, a, a flood just a localized flood can uh, absolutely smash up uh, rocks and and level hillsides uh, it's utterly amazing so you have to consider that what would be happening is the entire landscape in a worldwide flood uh, the entire landscape would be upheaved and set back down and upheaved and set back down and upheaved and set back down everything would be mixed with everything everywhere all seeds of types of specific trees and plants would be mixed and deposited everywhere it would utterly reface the entire landscape but yet these four waterways that we always see translated as rivers that went out of the Garden of Eden, the Gan Oden. They are still in existence, running their same course at the time of Moses or Mashe, as they were at the time of Adam and Hua, Eve. I think that's amazing that those, if they were rivers, those four rivers would come through the unimaginable catastrophe and refacing of a worldwide flood unscathed. Now, you know, like many of you, I started out years ago listening to a, a whole lot of Kent Hovind. And, you know, I thought it was awesome. He'd go to universities and, uh, you know, he'd win these debates against all these uh, various academics and, and whatnot. And boy, he really... He really pulled a number on everybody, didn't he, the last few years? But um, he used to always say, because he did a number of debates on whether or not there was uh, the, a worldwide flood at the time of Nah Noah. And he used to say, well, if the flood was only going to be local, why did he have Noah build an ark? Why didn't he just tell him to move? And, you know, without being a botanist and uh, uh, an entomologist and uh, ichthyologist and every other kind of uh, specific naturalist there is who I'm sure have uh, an abundant amount of information above and beyond what I know, 
I would say this from my paltry observations of the world I live in, the small world I live in. Any time that you introduce a new species of anything into an ecosystem that currently exists, you run the risk of immense damage to that ecosystem. I don't care if it's a plant or if it's something as small as a ladybug or something as imposing as a, a python. You see, I've experienced, even where I live in the uh, American Midwest, the introduction of these Japanese ladybugs a decade or two ago that completely upset the ecosystem here. And now you have the introduction of a type of Chinese praying mantis that's doing the same thing. It's causing a lot of problems with the current ecosystem because of what they hunt and eat. In South Australia, the farmers there deal with, every few years now, a plague of house mice. The plagues are so horrific that they they can't kill and burn them fast enough. They, they gather mounds, huge, huge, enormous mounds of these things and have to destroy them. That's how bad these plagues of house mice get in South Australia. And the reason for that is because these house mice were introduced to the Australian ecosystem. And these house mice have very few natural predators in that South Australian ecosystem. So they are wreaking havoc on that ecosystem. There are people who have for some time been releasing their uh, exotic constrictor snakes into the wilds of the swamps and outbacks of Florida. And it is uh, theorized that what is happening is these snakes with few natural predators in the Everglades and the Florida outback are increasing in size so amazingly that um, it may not be very long until we start uh, depending on how much the media uh, suppresses these kinds of stories, start hearing these stories about people out in the Everglades encountering these gigantic pythons and various constrictors that don't belong there. They don't belong there because they don't have enough natural predators to help quell their numbers. This is the kind of problem that occurs when you introduce a foreign um, species of any kind into a specific ecosystem. You see, because we know that the world isn't the world. The world is not uniform. This world is made up of many different lands with their own ecosystems. And all their ecosystems are so fine-tuned and delicately balanced that <clears throat> all you have to do is introduce one item in addition to really mess the whole thing up. So, why didn't Noah and all those specific animals just move? Well, I would say that that's one reason. <clears throat> and then when you add to that the fact that long after Noah's flood, you see a people called the Kini. Q-Y-N with a Y at the end denoting a people of Kini. You see Kani. Now that name, 
QYN. You'll find it first. I'm glad I'm still in Genesis because I will go forward to 4. Now, here's the first occurrence. QYN714. Keen. Okay? It says, the name of the first child also of a place in Palestine and of an oriental tribe. Gosh, I don't know why it would be an oriental tribe. Do you think that just by coincidence, <clears throat> this oriental, let's just say eastern, because we know that we know that Cain had to go east, Kadem, and to the land of Nud, which is really just wandering. And now how he went there, I don't know. So anyways, 7014 is Keen. Let's do it here. Yeah. So 7014. Search. And you're going to see pretty much all the references in Genesis chapter 4 until you get to Numbers 24-22. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Ashur shall carry you away captive. And then in Joshua 15:57. Cain was one of the cities that were taken by one of the various tribes of Yisrael. Now, that's not the only references. We have Kin E. And here we have Kun E. That so called Yad at the end there, that E denotes a people of. You can see that with anyone. You can see that with the Amorite. It's Amari. The Jebusite is Yebusi. The Judahite is Yehudi. Yehudi. And here we've got Kenny. Genesis 15, long after Noah's flood, the Kenny and the Kenazi and the Kadmani. Numbers 24, 21. This is when Balaam is giving his blessings and uh, curses. Um, and I just read that one. And Judges 1, 16, the children of the Kenny. Judges 4, 11, now Eber the Kenny. And so on and so forth. So we have Kenny. Now, you could argue and say, that it is a coincidence that that is just a just a tribe that we actually don't have a uh, a genealogy for like we don't have one of Noah's sons giving birth to a keen and I'll tell you something these people they would have known their history they would have known they would have known that the first man born named keen was murderer, murdered his brother, um, and was thus cursed from the Adama, the soil, and uh, relegated to a, a life of wandering. The land of Nud. I mean, I guess he didn't wander his whole life since he built a city. You have to stay in one place, I guess, to build a city, right? But, you know, given the fact that everybody would know history like that, what are the odds that somebody would actually want to name their child after the first murderer who murdered his brother? It's kind of like, you know, certain names, they get a real, you know, they get a real uh, kibosh on them. Um... And it would seem that only the most morbid person would want to give their child that name because names become names become accursed. Uh, a name is a reputation. 
and when it becomes accursed like that, um, people aren't really lining up to name their children that name. And furthermore, since the Bible never tells us that there is a distinction, just the same way as with Gahun, the Gahun that we see um, being routed, the upper water course of it being routed to the west side of the city of Duid, which is Ziun. There's nothing in the scripture that tells us that that is a different Gihun. It doesn't tell us that it is a spring named Gihun. It is simply Gihun. So when we see <coughs> a keen, and we're not told that it's a different keen, then if we can apply Occam's razor, we would have to assume that these people are in some way descendants of the only keen we know of. So that's just thoughts on the flood. Now, as a sort of a segue from that, um, as part of sketching out the tribes and their inheritance to get an idea of the geography of the land so we can determine whether or not these events ever took place over in the Middle East. Now, I find this to be vast, vastly, vastly important. Uh, because for one reason, you know, there is, uh, there and has been for some time, a conspiracy of uh, very powerful people who are not Jews. I don't know what they are, but if we're to believe any of the words of Jesus from Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, uh, we would know that eschatologically there will be people who call themselves Uideos, Jews of Judah that are not. He doesn't say everybody who calls themselves Yehudi or Uideos of Judah are imposters, but there are those who are. Because I believe we have a, a very powerful group of imposters who have taken over this land and who have murdered their way through this land. And now I'm not pointing the accusative finger at everyone who dwells there, everyone who believes that their genealogy is from Judah, per se, because uh, we're talking about this being established in 1948. Now, many people have been born and raised there not knowing anything else. But that's the way that these evil, powerful people do things. They use people, oftentimes even without any wicked motives, people who are wrongly informed, uninformed, people who are deceived, um, you know, to populate Palestine uh, into the state of Israel in the 40s when they did, they really had to um, put a lot of pressure on the people who identified as Jews to go over there because it's not a great place. So the geography matters because we have this uh, conspiracy of um, very evil shatan um, that have no business being over there, causing wars and conflicts with the people in the land and absolutely everyone everywhere around them. Now, if you can prove that it's never happened there anyways, I would say that that's a good argument that those people shouldn't even be there. Does that mean everyone who identifies as a Jew over there should be expelled? 
well, you know, uh, based on the population that there is there, there seems to be enough land, and, I, you know, you, we could talk about reparations, and in, in, I, I tell you what, uh, the state of Israel is pulling in so much money through extortion and, and lies uh, annually that they certainly could afford to absolutely uh, pay some major major reparations first to the Palestinians and uh, next to, to the neighboring peoples that they have done nothing but war with and murder and traumatize and everything else and then also to the German people and the American people people that they have been extorting and 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 how about the Western Christian population completely duped because most of them won't even crack open their Bible and study to show themselves approved. But hey, that's probably a rabbit trail. The whole point is, it is important where this stuff happened. And so I've been doing my small part to try to point out inconsistencies. So let me go with this one. Now, there is a waterway, a nair, called the Parath, right? <clears throat> and it is Strong's 6578. 6578. Search. Now, th this. Uh, waterway, Parath, we know that it, it is uh, somewhere in a near proximity to the land of promise. And you can just, you know, punch in 6578 and look at all the quotes and remember that not all the words around this word that we're looking at are going to be exactly right either. Uh, I was just looking at portions of the book of Isaiah before I made this video and boy, the translational chicanery. <laughs> it's not laughable. It's just you hang your head and and pray that the Father will deliver us from this famine of the Word. So yeah, unto Lebanon. Now, yeah, it, and I've pointed this out before, right? Because I've talked a little bit about the Parath, which is translated as Euphrates. Like Deuteronomy 1 7, turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and unto all the places nigh thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, and to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, <laughs> the river Euphrates. Now we've done. Um, these maps, but I want to remind you, okay? Maybe I'll just open up um, a Google Maps, right? Um, there we go, map of the Middle East. Here we go, a Google Map. And even though these maps don't, they, they don't, um, specialize in, 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 in pointing out rivers very much, we can see where rivers are. Um, now, one thing you'll find that's interesting, though, is when we go over here and we try to get our bearings as far as where the Euphrates is, and it's going to be right here. Okay, you got the Persian Gulf, Euphrates, and, and, then, and then Tigris over here. And now here we can clearly see uh, what the path of the Nile is, right, through Egypt. Over here, the Euphrates, is it's harder to see um, its path, but it, it runs <clears throat> far north of what is Lebanon today and through uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, it has a number of uh, like smaller lakes uh, along its course. Here we got uh, uh, Tigris there, and here now we can see. Here's the Euphrates. First, you got to zoom. You got to zoom way, 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 way in, and you see this lake. Uh, uh, 
Assad is, is along is along the path of of the Euphrates. Now I'm pull out. Now you see, because it goes up here, okay, and then all the way over to here, and you get a wide shot. Get a wide shot of what the path of Euphrates is. Persian Gulf, okay, up here, Baghdad, uh, northern part of Syria, and then continues upwards. Oh. Oh, heck, it didn't go anywhere near Lebanon. But Lebanon is mentioned all the time in relation to the Parath, which they translate Euphrates. You see, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Well, guys, I mean, I know that you're twisting things around, but I would hope that you could at least get, like, the modern rivers and countries to line up because they're nowhere near one another. And there's a number of times when you're going to see Lebanon and the Euphrates as synonymous. You will see that Euphrates most oftentimes referred to in the north uh, more than the east. Now, if that wasn't enough, this is one of my favorite things. It's uh, Genesis 15, 18, where Yahweh is promising Abram the land that his descendants are going to inherit. And he says, In the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. Ah, from the river of Matsurim, they say Egypt, unto the great river so it's actually unto the Ner Gadul the Ner Parath the great river from the river of Egypt <laughs> unto the great river the river Euphrates the great river I hope I can get these uh... oh no 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 go way back I hope I can get these uh, search results <clears throat> to come up uh, that I did the other day. So let me see here real quick. Uh, here we go. Let's try top 10 rivers of the world. I'm sure if Yahweh refers to the Euphrates or Parath as the great river, the Ner Gadol, in the same verse as he refers to the river of Egypt. So, in contrast, that would be a greater river than the river of Egypt. The great river, the river Euphrates. Oh, here we go. Top 10 largest rivers in the world. What is it? Oh, the Nile. <laughs> the Nile's number one. I, you know what? I would have expected to see Euphrates. That's weird. Niles, number one. Well, you know what? Maybe their maybe their criteria is uh, is different than Yahweh's. So maybe Euphrates will be number two. Nope, the Amazon. Number three, ah, the Yangtze. Number four, Mississippi. Well, it's got to be in here, right? It's it's gonna have to at least be in the top ten, right? Oh, let me see. Number five, Yenisei. Number six, the Yellow River. Number seven, the Ob River. Number eight, the Piranha River. Number nine, the Congo River. Number ten, the Amur River. Well, where is Euphrates? Let me try another search here. How about... Let's just do... Um, let's see... are just rivers of the world list. Let's just say that's some, that's some good syntax. John. Oh, here we go. Hey, list of rivers by discharge. So that's a good, good thing. You know, how much, um, how much water they're, you know, they're putting out. <clears throat> it's a big list. This is a big list. Uh, let's see one, 
and I'm just going to start listing them in order. So number one is Amazon because it's got the most discharge. Now in the other one, number one was Nile because the Nile covers the most ground. I mean, it covers a lot of ground, man, the Nile. But anyways, so let's see. Starting with number one being Amazon, then Congo, Ganges, Orinoco, Madeira, Yangtze, Negro, Rio de la Plata, Yenisei, Bra Maputra, <laughs> Japura, Piranha, Lena, St. Lawrence, Mississippi, Maranon, Ganges, Mekong, Tocantins, Tapanos, Ucali, Irrawaddy, Ob. I know the Euphrates got to be here somewhere. Good grief, I'm already in 24. Amur, Purus, Beni, Mackenzie, Quad, Zingu, Pearl, Mamare, Putemayo, uh, Juru, Kasai, Guevara, Volga, Ohio, Columbia, Tsi, Danube, Zimbabwe, Magdalena. Stop me when you hear Euphrates, okay? Napo, Indus, Mata, Yukon, Madre de Dios, Ariguaya, Capuas. Obviously, my Spanish is a little rusty. Fly. Uh, Niagara, Niger, Uruguay, Barito, Aldan, Branco, Detroit, St. Clair, Atrato, Salwiden. You're telling me that the Euphrates doesn't have anything better to offer than what comes out of Detroit? Salween, Caroni, uh, Mambarano, Angara, uh, Juruena, Kama, Ubangi, Chidwin, Chindwin, uh, Tele Perez, Pecora, Apoporis, Sepic, Kolyama, I can't even pronounce that, <laughs> Nisiyana, Tunguska, okay, Tunguska, Upper Meghna, Gadavari, uh, Heualaga, Fraser, Caladan, Slave, Northern Divina, Katagana, uh, Kikori, Paranaba, Juta, Kora, Ganganara, Irtish, I'm in 87. I'm in 87. 91 is the Nile by volume. So we've hit the Nile by volume now. Okay? And we're still not seeing the Euphrates. Right? Shouldn't the Euphrates at least be in front of it uh, by volume? It's nowhere near as long, right? It's nowhere near as wide, right? But it should be somewhere like in volume, right? <sighs> Tigre, Quango, Paraguay, Red, Ufalus, Yellow. Go on and on on and on. Missouri, Rio Grande, all the rivers of North America have already um, been listed far above in output. That's 139 rivers. 139 rivers. I just went through. 139. And Euphrates is nowhere to be seen. No. They have outflow. Okay, so all these rivers they listed, um, they list the rivers that they outflow into. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm just scrolling through to see if they outflow into the Great River. You've got the Nile and the Euphrates. Oh, all right, fine, not the Nile. This is why people have to play word games, because people say, well, uh, the, river, <laughs> the river of Egypt probably refers to some wadi that we can see from uh, uh, high airplane pictures um, that exists there. It probably means the wadi, maybe, or something. But the funny thing is, even if you were to compare the Euphrates of today to, to nearly any river, I and mean, Yahweh knows all the rivers of the world, you know. But he's going to call the Euphrates great. Now, interestingly enough... <clears throat> I can just do a little search on the Euphrates. It's funny what <laughs> what perspective can do because you don't know how many feet this is. 
uh, crossed and you don't know the depth or anything but when you look at it like this you look and you say oh that looks like it, it could be a mighty river look how placid it is too so it's not pushing it's not pushing some hard flow and here's a map of it again you see that goes nowhere near Lebanon nowhere near Lebanon you want to get to the Euphrates you're crossing a desert buddy end of story um, view of the Murat River maybe that's a tributary I can't even tell there's a river there that's pathetic it says this is supposed to be a French map from the 17th century showing the Euphrates and the Tigris okay some some life I guess on the river yeah oh Kiban Dam in Turkey first dam on the Euphrates after it emerges from the confluence of the Karasu in the Muratsu Qual Atjabar in Syria once perched on a hilltop overlooking the Euphrates Valley but now turned into an island by the flooding of Lake Assad a fishing boat in the Euphrates southern Iraq look how placid that is look how placid that is I have a river that I grew up near called the Kankakee that's at least this size at least so you know what are you gonna do and look here you see all those all those bridges because it's so easy to build bridges across because it's it's not that big a deal he may tell me oh well it's a pretty decent sized river yeah well there's a lot it's it's not even making it in any of the top lists of the world's rivers but I'm telling you right now Yahweh doesn't say the great river once he says it again and again Joshua 1 4 from the wilderness and the Lebanon unto the great Nair uh, the Nair Parath translated Euphrates I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep reminding you that I don't know that Nair is river but that's how it's always translated and in fact I've been uncovering information that tell me I need to examine very closely whether these uh, waterways or bodies of water called Nair are rivers at all and uh, to the Euphrates and pertain so we've got two times that it's called the great the great especially when it's said in the same verse as uh, the river of Egypt which I mean we can dance around all day but look if you told anybody um, the river of Egypt what are they gonna think of gonna think of the Nile now I know I'm going through this kind of fast and I believe there's at least one other time where it's called the Great River. Great River, Great River. So there's the two times, and then Joshua three times. Okay, yeah, it's at least three times. And as far as worldwide rivers go, doesn't even make it into the top 100 <clears throat> it isn't where it's supposed to be you know the tribe of Reuben spread out um, from the east of where they were at so they were supposed to be to the east of Jordan they spread out east from there um, all the way to the Parath translated Euphrates not with the Syrian desert there that land over there is not a good land these people were agrarian people they had flocks uh, they farmed they would not be viewing this land as wonderful land I'm sorry again I guess the argument that it could be made that it's been refaced and I guess that that's a bridge that we're gonna have to cross when we get to it bridges is another thing <laughs> But anyways, 
so you can you can take my word i'm 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 on this, but I'm one man, and my day only has 24 hours. Um, and I'm doing my best to try to figure out how this mapping should be done. <clears throat> I can tell you one thing. I'm getting ready to do the, um, uh, the charting out of the inheritance of Judah, and I stumbled across the lists of the cities and villages and surrounding areas that Judah inherited. And when you hear it, you're going to say, there's just no way. There's just no way that that many peoples that were agrarian peoples ever dwelt in that area that were being told that they dwelt in. There's no possible way so we'll get to that um i'm at 120 so um hopefully you know i i have more um good things to offer with um uh, more conclusions but you know you don't always get conclusions sometimes when you take that red pill you get a lot more questions than answers but it's it comes with the territory, and um, I wouldn't have it any other way. So, uh, until next time, uh, everybody take care of yourselves, please, and your neighbors, and bless you.